Witchcraft, sorcery, the law, legalism, blood, salt, sandals. Um, what does all this have to do with the menorah and covenant and ancient pathways? <laughs> well, you'll have to watch the video to find out, silly. That's why this is called a teaser. Yeah, it's a little bit beyond me, too. That you gave me the stars, put them out of my reach. Call me the waters a little too deep. Oh, I've never been so aware of my need. You keep on making me see. It's way beyond me. Hello, my name is Phil Fanstill, and this is The Phil Files. And the title of this video, I've actually planned the title ahead. Most of the time I make up the title after I make the video, but this one I actually planned it ahead. So the title of this video, Controlling, Commanding, and Calling the Chosen. All right, what does that mean? And like I said, what does that have to do with witchcraft and sorcery and legalism and all this and the menorah and these things? Well, we're going to look at each one of those words uh, and kind of get into each one of them, what, what they mean. Not so much and um because that's that's just conjunction but well we just addressed it so and we're moving on okay so control um control in the bible is not a good thing all right we're gonna we're gonna see this so we actually <laughs> they got from good from terrible to best to calling or control command call chosen all right two, 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 two. all right Control is manipulation. That's basically what witchcraft is. Witchcraft, sorcery, idolatry, this is manipulation. You're manipulating forces, spirits, okay, to accomplish what you want. Okay, and the Bible says witchcraft is a, is a rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. So there's this connection between rebellion and witchcraft. Rebellion is when we reject God's way and go our way, all right? And so that we're trying to control the world, we're trying to control the outcome, we're trying to control everything, and this is this is what uh, witchcraft is. This is kind of the control. Now, they, so it, that might be another video for another day. But if you think about, it, that's what witchcraft is. You're trying to control the elements. You're trying to control the spirits. You're trying to control situations. You with the right words, with the right hocus pocus or wand or whatever, excelsior or whatever. Uh, you're trying to control the outcome. Okay. And that is what sorcery is, and the Bible's <laughs> uh, remedy for witchcraft is uh, burning. So that's the, you know, burn the witch kind of thing. So that's not good. So controlling is bad. Okay, we're going to come back to kind of how these match up. The next one is command. Now, commanding is not as bad, all right? But there's still this air, this this part of control, okay? This kind of, I'm going to tell you what to do. And this is where you get uh, dictatorships, tyrants, you know, so forth kings and so forth. People that want to tell you, control you, and tell you what to do. And I think uh, I'm going to go and make a connection in the Bible. In the Bible, the first thing that God had to do with his, the Hebrews was pull them out of Egypt, pull them out of that idolatry. First thing he had to do was take them out of the sorcery, out of the sorcery, out of the, the witchcraft, out of that control of Egypt. And he did it with the ten plagues and bringing them out. Okay. Then he had to, once he got that, he introduced the law okay to free them from sorcery okay but the problem is the law then became and and if you study the history of the israelites all right uh early in their their uh, up until the babylonian captivity they were still struggling with the idolatry they're still struggling with trying to control things trying to worship the gods and control the spirits to get what they wanted okay and so they but they were cured of that at the babylonian captivity when they returned from Babylon, idolatry was really never an issue. So the first thing that had to be cured was the idolatry, the control. But the problem is it was replaced by the law, all right? That's the command, okay? The law, legalism, all right? And so the command, it works. The, I, and, and I did this in my class. The problem <laughs> with being a dictator is it works. That's why a lot of people do it. All right? That's why dictatorship is so much easier than than the other better forms of government. Okay, so I actually did this in my class. We we had this uh, self government grid uh, in my class. I was trying to get them to one learn these government systems and so forth, but also do it in such a way that it was a their choice. You know, they instead of me telling them what to do, blah blah blah, 
it was the, something they did. So I have a system, very simple, but basically the lowest level was anarchy, then tyranny, then monarchy, then democratic republic, and then utopia. Okay, so if they're at the bottom, they got assigned seats. If they got to the top, they got free seats. And there were other, but those were the that was a big perk. But the other things and uh, so they they earned the higher they up, you know. But that in order to get up higher, they had to you know follow directions and be self governing. All right, so that's why it's called the self government system. But but the, so when we look at controlling, controlling is that lowest. It's getting you trying to control the anarchy, the chaos. Okay. Well, then you got the tyrant, the command, the legalism. And the problem with legalism, like I said, is it works. And I've seen too many people in Christianity revert to legalism. And it's like, well, it, you know, the law says. Well, the Bible says the law kills, <laughs> but the Spirit gives life. And so people are always going back to the law. That's, that's a trap. I mean, and that's what Jesus fought against when he came up to the earth. And he, he came, and the idolatry wasn't an issue. Okay. Now it was the legalism. So he came against the legalism of the Pharisees. And you know how they would basically um, control, you know, they would command and dictate and, and, and it was death. So he had to break that. Now, when he, one of the things that Jesus did is he did not control people. He did not command people. Now he commanded the spirits. He had authority and he did take command at times, especially with demonic spirits and so forth. Uh, and, but he did not command the disciples to follow him. All right? He called them, and that's the third level. Okay, so he called the disciples, and there are there are actually you know the twelve disciples, but there are seventy. There are more than twelve, but he called specifically. And the Bible talks about when he called Matthew, when he called Philip, or when he called Andrew. It talks about these different uh, people being called. Um, it, it, it only mentioned, I think, the rich young ruler. I was just reading that the other day. The rich young ruler was called, but he could not meet. God, Jesus called him, but he said, but go sell all you have and come and follow me. So they're just calling, but he did not respond. And that's the thing about calling. That's The Holy Spirit, uh, uh, I've heard this said, and, and this, I find this very true, is a gentleman. Um, gentlemen don't demand or command uh, they're not legalistic. All right, they call. They call. Um, you know, a gentleman leads. Okay, uh, and he calls um, when he's courting <laughs> or dating or whatever. He calls uh, the person that would be his bride, and you know, he calls her to him. He doesn't demand that she comes. That's not love. Okay, so there is this calling. All right. Um, now she can accept or reject, and, and that, that. But there's this calling. Well, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He calls us. He calls us, he compels us, he draws us. But we have to then become the chosen. Now, and there's a verse uh, in the Bible that says, many are called, but few are chosen. And, and I'm going to show you how all this works with the menorah here in a second, and the ancient pathways and all this. But control is uh, the witchcraft. Okay, Command is the legalism. Calling is what this gospel is. It's a calling. Many are called. Okay, and many, I believe, respond to that call, but they, they don't ever end up from being the call to the chosen. And I, the best analogy I can give is like in the military, you know, the Uncle Sam poster, I want you in the military. He's calling everybody, okay, and a lot of people sign up for the military in times of war, especially even now. A lot of men and women serve our country honorably in, in the military, and, and, uh, and thank God for them, okay, but they're called. But now, the chosen are the ones that not only are called, but then they go to boot camp, and then they dedicate their lives and they 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 serve the Lord. I was just talking to um, or serve their country. I was just talking to a, a patient today whose uh, husband was injured in Iraq. You know, and there is a price that people pay. There is a price not only for the people that are injured, but the, for their families. There is a price that people pay um, to to become the chosen. <laughs> Uh, it reminds me of the old war movies, you know, like uh, Braveheart or, um, uh, you know, maybe Dirty Dozen or whatever, where there's this calling and it's so exciting. Yes, fight, you know, freedom. Okay. There's this calling. It's awesome. And people respond and, Arr! you know, they moon the British, whatever. They they call and they just. <laughs> but then later in the movie, you see those same people getting slaughtered, dying. And that, that's the price. Many are called, but few are chosen. Because to be chosen, to get to that last level, it takes sacrifice. 
Jesus says, come after me, take up your cross and follow me. He's basically bidding us, he's calling us to come and die. And I haven't done that. <laughs> that's hard. That's, that's, that, there's the rub. <laughs> there's the rub. So, okay. So, uh, so I'm going to kind of make a connection and I'm going to tell some story about elephants. Okay. So many are called, few are chosen. So we have this level of control. And now this is actually what God breaks us from in the covenants. Okay. And this is not a lesson on the covenants. I'm just going to go through this really quick. The first one is what's, it's called the blood covenant. Okay. And he's breaking us. He's buying us. He's purchasing. That's what Jesus did. Uh, on the cross, he purchased us, and we, if we receive that, we enter into that covenant. So, as I was talking in a video a couple while back about the menorah, you have God initiates, we respond. Actually, I guess they go from the yeah left to right. So, uh, so God initiates, we respond. Okay, blood covenant. Then the next covenant is a salt friendship covenant. This is the legalism, all right, and it's it's better than the the sorcery. Okay, we're getting called out of contr being controlled. And we're being so we're being set free from that. Then the second one is the legalism, and we're 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 trying to command. We're still trying to you know the legalism. People have used the law and used legalism to control people. I mean, so there is a connection between controlling and commanding. The legalism, but God calls us out of that. He brings us out of that, and He calls us, and that and to be His disciple, to follow Him. And of course, we He uh, initiates, we respond. And then the last one, that's where. That's the bridal, the wedding supper lamb. That's the the consummation of, of this whole this whole history of the earth. I mean, that in a nutshell, that's what the, the story of the redemption of mankind is in the menorah. But it's it's we're we're being called out of sin and rebellion, out of witchcraft. We're we're um, we're bloody. Jesus had to sacrifice, uh, shed his blood for us. And then the law. All right, but that that's a problem too. Though it does set up Paul talks. We won't get into law and grace and all that today. But then sets up the being called. But we have to be, and the Bible talks numerous times about this. You know, uh, about preparing ourselves, being wise, and, and so forth. And so elephants. Okay, <laughs> this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, uh, this is elephants. How do they train elephants? Okay, and I and I. And I I'm totally remembering this from a, some sermon, and you know, so I could totally be missing this. If you're a pachydermist or pachyderm, if you're an elephant trainer and I'm wrong, you go ahead and tell me or just yell off the screen or you can comment. I'll, I'll take it because I am not claiming to be an expert on this. Okay. But from what I heard, <laughs> from what I heard from a friend, uh, here's how they train elephants. Okay. So to train an elephant, you capture the elephant, you know, they don't usually get baby elephants to train them because that's to feed them. So it's better to just go get a live one, take it, but you have to break it. So what they do is they take the elephant, they chain it, and they chain it to a really big tree, very powerful, tall tree, whatever, strong tree. And the elephant pulls and pulls and pulls and pulls, all right? And at some point, of course, they're also whipping it. They're, you know, trying to get it to break, okay? And at some point, the elephant breaks, and this, this is this is messed up, okay? This is messed up, but at some point the elephant breaks. So guess what they do that chain? They take the chain, and I don't know, they may they may ratchet it down, okay? But they take that chain and they take that elephant, and then once the elephant breaks, they can take that chain and put a little tent peg in the ground with the chain connected to it. Smallest resistance, but the elephant, if it wanted to, could just pull out that chain and be on its way and run over people on the way, you know, to get some peanuts, okay? But the elephant's broken, so they don't pull on the chain. They've been broken. They've been controlled. They've been subjugated. They've become slaves. So the elephant is controlled not by the actual circumstance, but by his understanding of the circumstance, okay? His, when, that tree was too much for him. Okay, and he couldn't break the tree. And at some point, he gives up. He quits. He, it's yeah, it's hopeless. He loses hope. Then he's tied to that little peg in the ground with the chain, and he he no longer resists. What areas of our lives are we control? What areas of our lives have we become subjugated? We just can't win. We just give up. We can't. We can't win. That's no use fighting. 
and you can live a long, healthy life in a zoo, and, and that's fine. But man, I want to be an elephant. I want to be like charging across, excuse me, charging across the, uh, well, I don't really want to go across the Alps because most of those elephants died. But I want to be with Hannibal charging across the African plains, trampling over Scipio and the Roman legions. Man, that's what I want to be. I don't want to be some elephant, you know, giving kids rides. Well, actually, that would be kind of fun, you know, if I were going to be an elephant. That would be... Anyway, whatever. I want to be free. Okay, so freedom, right? Freedom. That would be interesting if they had elephants in Braveheart. Nah, no, probably wouldn't have worked. But anyway, so elephants, they break them. But the thing is, the devil does that to us. And this is where this book comes in. Okay, so this book, really brief, as brief as I could be, let's be honest here. Uh, this book, I, I, uh, I got this book 20 years ago or something. It was at, I came to our church. And... Um, <laughs> And it's a really good book. But anyway, uh, I don't know if they sell it anymore. But Ancient Pathways. But what he talks about in this book is that, basically, here's the, here's the idea. When Adam and Eve were here, you know, Cain and Abel, okay, well, Satan was going after Cain. God told him that. He said, you know, you got to master over your sin. You, know, you can't give in to this or the devil's going to come in here and, and rip you to pieces. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And Cain killed his brother, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Well, when Cain and Abel, how many demons and devils and all that were there? Um, well, let's assume by the time of Noah, because I, I do, we won't get into demonology and devils and all this, but by the time of Noah, let's say there were, I don't get, give me a number, 100 million or a million, let's say a million devils and 10 million demons. I don't know, I'm just making up a number here. Okay, we don't really know, but here's the point. Since the flood, the demons and the devils have not been multiplying that we know of, okay? Uh, most people think any of the, all that happened before the flood, with the Nephilim and all this. But after the flood, the 11 million, 1 million devils, 10 million demons, or whatever the number is. But here's, here's the point. Mankind has been multiplying exponentially. We are now 7 billion people, okay? So what the devils have done is they've created systems of control. I'm reminded of a book called Treblinka. Now, Treblinka was a death camp, a Nazi death camp, similar to Auschwitz, okay? Uh, that was just about exterminating the Jews, all right? And um, this, this camp, Treblinka, killed, I think I was, well, I read this when I was in high school. Oh, man, uh, that's, a, that's a heavy, okay? But this book... Uh, was about this camp. They killed 25,000 Jews a day. You know how many guards they had? Less than a thousand. Less than a thousand guards. And actually, most of those were like Ukrainian or Romanian guards. Okay? The Nazis only made up from maybe 400, 300 to 400. Who knows? But a thousand men with guns were able to kill 25,000 people a day. Because of the systems that they had, the systems of control, the systems of annihilation, the systems of death. All right. So what this guy's arguing, to, to summarize, uh, is he's saying basically the devil has to create systems of control. He has to create pathways to control us. Now, the positive is God creates pathways too. He creates pathways of identity and and that's where, like, a father speaking over his sons and speaking over his daughters and speaking identity and, and purpose, okay? And, and the, you know, there's, there's certain things like the bar mitzvah, and that's not in the Bible, this, this idea of uh, initiation into manhood or into womanhood, all right? These ideas of how do we tell our young people, hey, you have, you, you're reaching something. I mean, we have graduations and stuff. Those are awesome, okay? But that's, that's the idea. And that, so God has set those up. He says, you know, th these are the ancient pathways. Walk in them. That's where it gets the title. Well, the devil has pathways too because he has to control people. He has sorcery, witchcraft. God's calling people. The devil's controlling people. The big difference. If somebody's trying to control you, run. <laughs> Don't walk. Run. Okay? If, if somebody's of God and they're trying to call you and, you know, that, okay, then you can respond to that. That's a choice, right? But if someone's controlling you, manipulating you, mm -mm. Danger, Will Robinson. Okay, get out of there. All right, so the ancient pathways, God's calling us. He's setting up systems of calling and putting identity and purpose in people. And, and, and the devil is using systems of control. So in Treblinka, and going back to that elephant, 
What eventually can happen with elephants is at some point, maybe they just get enough of it. I mean, they just, you know, I'm tired of this. And so they start pulling on that chain and who knew it came out, right? And then they run rampage, okay? Of course, if the trainer sees them, and this is, a, this is part of the system of control, if the trainer sees the elephant start to pull on that chain and start to kind of, the trainer's going to get the whip out there and start yelling at the elephant, start berate the elephant, try to put the elephant back in its place, all right? Because it knows if the elephant realizes the potential within inside of itself, if something rises up in that elephant, he says, I don't know what elephants say, but I don't want this anymore. Well, that may be Dumbo. But he, if he rises up as something inside that elephant, rises up and he breaks the chains. That trainer is a pancake, all right? And that's what happened to Treblinka. That Treblinka, the prisoners, because they kept certain Jews to do the dirty work. They killed 25,000 a day, but they keep strong... Uh, uh, men usually to do the dirty work or boys to clean up. Yeah, it's just terrible stuff, okay? Heavy read here. But eventually, they rebelled. And you see this in a lot of uh, movies like Amistad. You see this in uh, Defiance. The movie Defiance is awesome about the Jewish uh, uh, guerrillas in World War II. You see this in movies where they rise up. Braveheart's another example. Where they rise up. Something inside them is like, nah, <laughs> not this thing. You know, uh, freedom, you know, something rises up. Now, here's the thing. If something rises up inside you, you start seeing the systems of control. The devil is manipulating, controlling you, commanding you through legalism. A lot of Christians fall into the legalism trap, which is a type of control. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do that. If you do that, you're, you're mortal sin. You go to hell. I think hell is a system of control. I won't get into that here. But there are so many legalistic systems and these things that God has called us out of. He's freed us from. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He says, for freedom that God has set you free. All right? He's calling us out of that. But if you see this in your life, whatever it is, um, rise up. Something needs to just bubble up inside of you. You know, watch Braveheart. Awesome movie. Okay, awesome movie. Uh, watch Amistad. All right, when people rise up against injustice, against tyranny, against the betrayal. You know, Defiance is another great movie. Something rises up inside of that elephant, and you know they pff, trample. Okay, of course now when they start to rise up, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get an immediate kickback. You will get immediate kickback because there are devils out there and there are demons out there. And for their system to work, they can't have divergent. <laughs> they can't have people thinking. And so you can't have people, hey, you can't have one of the Jews going out there, hey guys, why are we letting 25,000 people a day get slaughtered? Why don't we just tell everybody to run out the machine guns? And yeah, a couple thousand will get killed, but the other 20,000 will overwhelm the machine guns. We'll take them all out and we'll. And we'll stop the trains and, you know, whatever. Now, if a guy starts standing up and doing that, what are the Nazis going to do? They're going to shoot him. They're going to take him out. You cannot have that. You cannot have people standing up to the systems. The systems only work if they keep people in fear and in control. Of course, what is Christ calling us to do? To submit to the system. No, wait. No. <laughs> That's not the right answer. Christ is calling us to stand up. To rise up. Rise up, O judge of the earth. No, actually, that's a song. But, okay, rise up. The same spirit's in you that raised Christ from the dead. Wicked. Rise up. Stand up. Fight. I'm not necessarily, you know, don't pick a fight in the bar or anything. But, but something rises up inside and you're like, I'm not going to be controlled anymore. Now, of course, the problem is, you know, just a little aside, is when you get free... Don't start using the system you just escaped from to enslave other people. You know, you gotta, you gotta, don't be a hypocrite, right? So if you get freed from this, then let other people, be free other people. And there's a trap. The sorcery is a trap. Witchcraft is a trap. Legalism is a trap, okay? And to a certain degree, uh, being called but not moving forward to being chosen is a trap, okay? But it's not as bad. It kind of goes from worst to best, right? So... But when you get called, you have to prepare yourself. You have to seek the greater things. You have to go for what God's called you to do. I'm going to close this video uh, before I ramble on <laughs> way too long. I, actually, I was looking at my notes. Notes, I actually took notes. 
I had a plan. I actually took, now I'm rambling. But I took notes and I just looked through them and I'm like, man, I covered everything. And I didn't like touch my nose 20 times and say, um, 35 times. Yeah, I notice these things. People now can start counting all the times he touches his nose and says, um. But anyway, I actually covered everything. So I'm going to close with my favorite poem after the poem I did last night, uh, which was a very meaningful poem. But you know, I, this is a, um, yeah, I did a video last night on a student of mine. Uh, this is If by Rudyard Kipling. Yeah, this, I think, sums up this idea of breaking free of the systems of control. When people try to enslave you and try to keep you, how do you respond? You know, how do you react? How, what if? Okay. So, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting. Or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. That's one of my problems, I just look too good and talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think, not make thoughts your aim. That's something to think about there. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it all on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve you long, your, to serve your turn long after they're gone. And so hold on and there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, Hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose a common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. That's what God is calling us to do. That is what he's calling us to do. He's calling us to be heirs of Christ, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He's calling us to take up the cross and follow Jesus. He's calling us. Are we going to respond are we going to reciprocate? And that's it. You know, your answer now is meaningless. The way your life answers that, to quote Gladiator, is what echoes in eternity. Shalom. God bless.